I want to read uh, the first passage of scripture that I want to read is in uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. And Jesus says, in everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Now this particular verse is repeated in Luke chapter 6 verse 31, but Matthew contains all the information about it that Luke has and then some, so we're going to stay in Matthew for the study of this particular idea here. Very uh, familiar passage, contains two principles, one which is evident and one which is perhaps a little more difficult to, uh, to grasp. One which is practical and one which is theological in nature. So our study tonight is going to review the two principles in context of the passage that we're going to look at and how it fits in in the, in the entire Bible as well. So we've kind of set a bit of a challenge for us. That's why I said make sure you have your Bibles because we're going to be looking at a lot of passages. Um, Rabbi Hillel, the great Jewish teacher of that era, taught the following concerning a person's treatment of others. He says, what is hateful to thyself, do not to thy neighbor. For this is the whole law, and all else is its exposition. Now when you look at that on the surface, it, it kind of sounds good, but when you really study this approach closely, you see that it's a little bit on the selfish side. In other words, you withhold injury to other people so that you will not receive injury in return. You don't hurt somebody because you don't want to be hurt. And you know, that may work for you, but that's not a very, you know, very lofty idea. Jesus turns this saying around when He says, treat others in the same way you want others to treat you. Not only does Jesus realign Rabbi Hillel's dictum, he also provides ample teaching to clarify how to apply this golden rule. You know, we often say this is the golden rule in the Bible. I believe Marty even mentioned it this morning in his, in his lesson. You know, it fits into so many uh, ideas, so many concepts. It's the basis for so much in Christianity. And so not only does Jesus kind of realign the rabbi's teaching, he also gives us practical ways to put this into practice. And so Matthew, what I read before, Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, is a concluding statement summarizing much of what Jesus has been saying in a very long discourse to His disciples, which we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. So His statement about how to treat others in chapter 7 verse 12 concludes much of what he has taught beginning in chapter 5 and going all the way to the end of chapter 7. For example, in treating others as you would want to be treated, Jesus says that we should speak kindly. Speak kindly one to another. Let's read that passage, shall we? He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up, the, uh, paid up to the last cent. So Jesus says, so how's the first way that you adapt this teaching, treat others the way you want it to be treated? Speak kindly to one another. He reminds us of the power of the tongue to bless or to curse or to start trouble. 
You know, most of the time in the church when there's trouble, it usually starts with something that someone has said. Jesus also begins with the basic element of personal relationships. And the basic element of personal relationships is kind speech. It doesn't matter if it's your golf buddy or if it's your wife or if it's your father or if it's your brother in the Lord or if it's your boss or if it's your coworker or whatever it is. The basic element of personal relationships is kind speech. And he also provides the manner in which disputes can be neutralized before becoming violent and destructive confrontations. He says, seek reconciliation first. You know, this is humbling and difficult, but it dissipates anger and it avoids worse trouble. And so if we want kind words, we should be willing to speak kindly to others. Another way to treat people, Jesus says, is to respect them. Respect one another, and he continues teaching, verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of these parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And so Jesus moves from words to actions and uses sexual immorality as the example of ultimate disrespect for self and for others. We know that sexual sins are against one's own body and thus they scar deeply. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 6.18. That's why they need to be rooted out from the very start. A lack of respect for self usually leads to the disrespect of others, even to the extent of adultery against our spouse. If we want to treat others the way we want to be treated, Jesus says, be faithful. Be faithful. In Matthew 5.31 he says, it was, says who, it was said, rather, whoever sends his wife away, let him give, him a, give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You want others to treat you the way you want to be treated? Be faithful one to another. I mean, the common fruit of sexual sin is the breaking of a covenant of marriage. One goes from sinning against one's own body to sinning against God by reneging on our promise to our spouse before Him. A broken promise leads to a broken life for so many. Now I know we could talk about this, well, well, this is talking about marriage, and yes, of course it is talking about marriage, but in the context of how we should treat each other, Jesus is saying, not only in marriage, but in all relation, be faithful to each other, be faithful to your word, be faithful to the relationship that you're, that you're in. Then he says, if you want to be treated properly, then be honest. Be honest, with, be honest with one another. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37, he says again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of His feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. No relationship, whether it be marriage or business or social, can bloom, can survive without honesty. Confidence, peace of mind, love, joy, all of these things are based on the degree of trust we enjoy with other people. If we want 
individuals to trust us, then we need to be honest and open and transparent with other people. He goes on to say, whoops, too fast. He goes on to say, if you want to have people treat you properly, then you need to be a person who is forgiving in nature. Forgive one another. He says it this way. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you than doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now forgiving of course has two aspects as Jesus shows. One, patient with other people's mistakes, weaknesses and demands. A lot of times we don't see that as forgiveness. We don't understand that that is a form of forgiveness. I am patient with someone else's weakness, with someone else's demand. I'm being patient with them. That's a form of forgiveness. And then of course, the other form of forgiveness is generosity. Generosity with our love, generosity with our patience, generosity with our service, our talents, going that second mile, uh, doing the extra thing. Uh, what is that all about? Well, that's about giving, isn't it? The world is made up of sinners. And in the church, the church is made up of ex-sinners or forgiven sinners. And so we must understand that forgiveness, forgiveness is necessary in every relationship. You, you can't make a relationship without forgiveness being a, a, a prime element of that relationship. He goes on to say one other thing, don't be critical. Don't be critical, Matthew chapter seven. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so in order to understand this passage, we need to note that the word judge here refers to the habit of fault finding. Not like, you know, like God judges, you know, not that kind of judgment. He's talking about criticism, fault finding, always finding the negative. He's saying don't be hypercritical because if you are, you will be blind to your own faults and thereby draw criticism for your own behavior. You know, I want to tell you something. Finding fault in imperfect people is very, very easy. It's just about the easiest thing that you can do to look at someone and find something to criticize. That's easy. It's finding the good and celebrating the good and amplifying the good and encouraging the good. That part, that's the difficult, that's the difficult thing. And so let's keep reading just out of this passage, shall we? He says, um, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will uh, give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask of him? So finally, in chapter seven here, verses seven to 11, Jesus tells his disciples, 
why we should treat others in this way. You know, the golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat. Why do this? That's the how, you know, treat others as you would want, that's the how. But here he's, here's the why. The why is because this is how our Heavenly Father treats us. That's the why. He is kind. He respects our free will. He is always faithful. He is always honest. He is always forgiving. He always builds up the good and helps us with our weaknesses. That's the way God treats us. That whole passage there that, that I've been reading from back in Matthew 5 is simply a description of how God treats us. So if God treats us the way we want to be treated, we therefore should do the same for others. This is what leads to Jesus' summary statement in verse 12a. He says, in everything, therefore, therefore, you know, packages everything that came before it, he packages it together. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. Now, we already have this treatment from God as His children. We should therefore treat others as we would want to be treated and already are treated by the Lord Himself. Okay, so, so much for the practical application of this passage. Let's move on to the second half of the verse and maybe look at the theological application of this verse. After he says the beginning, he says, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, what significance do these actions have beyond these mere actions? In other words, what spiritual impact does this have that you treat people like this? Now if you read the verse, it would seem to say that doing all of these things fulfills or obeys or satisfies all that is written in the form of law and prophets. In other words, all the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, do this, do that, have this attitude, have that attitude, turn the other cheek, all of that stuff, it would seem to say, when you're doing this, you're fulfilling the law and the prophets. That's a good conclusion. Not quite accurate. See, the danger with this line of thinking is that we can easily fall into a kind of legalism. In other words, systematic good works and constant self-improvement to satisfy some new code or some new law. In other words, we trade in the old system that the Jews had of fastidious slavery to rituals and traditions. We exchange this for a new system of practical benevolence and good behavior to satisfy an ideal or to confirm our place with God. In this new legalism, turning the other cheek and resisting any impulse to criticize, remaining faithful and pursuing honesty, begins to become the way to satisfy the law and the prophets, rather than performing rituals and abstaining from certain foods like the Jews did in the Old Testament. In other words, the Sermon on the Mount becomes our new law in the New Testament. And the better we fulfill that law, and the more we keep it, the better we are as people. Now for those who are trying to fulfill this new rule, this golden rule, the thinking goes like this. The more I do, the more I feel saved, the, the closer I feel to God. The better I am, the closer I am to perfecting this new set of rules, the better person I am. I feel spiritual, I feel saved, I feel secure with every improvement I make towards this ideal. I'm just feeling better because I'm keeping the golden rule. I got it 60% down, I'm moving towards 70 and 75. If this is our approach, well, we've misunderstood not only the golden rule, but the basis upon which the golden rule rests, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
A good example of our misunderstanding are those people who do all of these things, kindness, honesty, graciousness, so on and so forth, and they do them better than us, yet they don't even believe in Jesus Christ. Have you ever met somebody like that? Met somebody not a member of the church, has nothing to do with Jesus, doesn't believe in all that Jesus, all that mumbo jumbo Jesus stuff, you know, they, have no, they have no time for it. And yet when you examine their lives, they're way kinder than we are. Man, they give time at the children's hospital, they give a tremendous amount of money, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't you know, curse, they're kind to a fault, they're good to a fault, they got great marriages. They make us look like you know, slackers. And yet they don't believe in Jesus Christ. We all know like people like that. Are they saved? Do they fulfill the law and the prophets by virtue of their ability to keep the golden rule a lot better than we are keeping the golden rule? And if they don't, why do we, who do lesser things, think that we accomplish this? In other words, why should we have any hope when our lives many times are often not as good as the people who don't believe in Jesus Christ or obey Him? That's a, that's a, I've heard that a lot of times. I've seen it a lot of times. Well, let me explain, if I can, how the law and prophets, that is all the commands and the instructions of God's word, how they are fulfilled. First of all, they are not fulfilled by works. Let's read Galatians, shall we? Chapter two, verse 16. This is Paul the Apostle. He says the following, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. I mean, this is a principle that we are familiar with, but we should understand that this covers any type of work, whether it is careful ritual keeping or scrupulous attention to personal behavior and attitude. Paul is saying here, nothing done by the effort of man is ever weighed against the law and the prophets. You know, the judgment against us over here in this scale Nothing we do is ever put on the other scale to balance that out. Secondly, the law and the prophets have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, not us. Let's read Romans, shall we? Romans chapter 10. Hang on a second here, let me get to Romans. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse one. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have great zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so Paul points to Jesus as a, uh, 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 or excuse me, uh, Paul points to the Jews rather, as a nation who misunderstood this very principle. During his life, Jesus fulfilled every prophecy made concerning his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And also during his life, he fulfilled every requirement of the law as to attitude, conduct, worship, and personal integrity. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, no sin was found in him, no sin. No sin of attitude, no sin of omission, no sin of commission. 
no sin of uh, uh, you know, error in, in the rituals, no sin. And so because of this, his life was perfect in every way and suitable therefore to offer as a substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf for all sinners. So let me say the same thing in another way. God sent Jesus to accomplish what no human being could. And what was that? To fulfill the law and the prophets. You see, only Jesus actually fulfilled the law and the prophets. I mean, not in a theoretical sense, not in a theological sense, He actually did it. Minute by minute by minute by minute by hour by day by year that He lived, He actually did it. Number three, so fulfilling the law and the prophets, if you're not following or you, know, you want to review, not fulfilled by works that we do, fulfilled by Jesus. And thirdly, fulfilled by us, we fulfill the law and the prophets through faith. Paul expresses it so clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse four. He says, for Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, the benefit of fulfilling the law and the prophets is that there is no condemnation for those who can do this. That's the beauty of it. If you can fulfill the law and the prophets, if you can fulfill all of that, then no one's going to condemn you, not even God. The problem is that no one can claim these benefits because everyone fails to obey the law and in so many ways are outside of God's purpose. We know those passages, Romans 3, 23, all of sin fallen short of the glory of God and Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin is death. We know those. Jesus resolves this by fulfilling both the law and the prophets and He offers to share with us the benefits of His perfection. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, when Paul says, you know, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know when he says that? There's no condemnation for Jesus, why? Because He was perfect. And there's no condemnation for us, why? Because we believe in Jesus. We arrive at the same place that he did, but we use another way to get there. He got there by actually fulfilling the law and the prophets. We get there because we believe in him. But the end result is the same. We are made perfect through association, not through accomplishment. Big difference, big difference. We don't actually fulfill the law and the prophets action by action, we are given the privileges and advantages of the one who has accomplished this because we believe in Him and we have expressed that faith in the way that He has asked us to do so, and that is through repentance and baptism. Acts chapter two, verse 38. So in the same way, we don't actually fulfill the golden rule. If you're wondering, where is he going with this? Well, I'm, I'm getting to the golden rule part. We don't actually fulfill the golden rule, action by action. We receive the advantages of the one who did obey the golden rule. And we receive the benefit of that through faith. And we continue to receive the benefit of that because we continue to believe and obey Him the best we can. The best we can. Again, Marty this morning, you know, we don't discuss our lessons with each other, said the very same thing. We arrive there not through perfect obedience. We, we arrive there through faith. God does not even ask us for perfection. He asks us for faithfulness. Big difference. So let's talk about the golden rule in salvation, shall we? The next question is this. What therefore is the relationship between the golden rule and my salvation? 
Why bother if I receive the benefits by faith? And the answer to this question is, only the saved can truly obey the golden rule, in other words, fulfill the law and the prophets and receive the benefits. Only the saved can do that. The unsaved, those who reject Christ, they can talk about the golden rule, they can know the golden rule, but they can't fulfill it. Why? Well, consider Jesus' audience for these teachings. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it specifically states that Jesus had brought aside His disciples in order to explain to them the things of the kingdom. So the verse concerning the golden rule was addressed to the disciples, to believers. Secondly, as we mentioned, Jesus fulfills the golden rules for His disciples. Remember, we can't fulfill the law and the prophets the old way, you know, doing rituals and commands and stuff like that, but neither can we perfectly fulfill the golden rule in the new way. In other words, treating each other as we would be treated at the level that Jesus is talking about. Jesus does this for us in every way and confers upon us on us, rather, His perfection by virtue of faith. What does Paul say? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Because I am united to Jesus by faith, I've also fulfilled the law and the prophets and the golden rule. If what we're talking about is how do I, you know, perfectly do this? And then, I know there's still a question there. And the question is, well, wait a minute now. If we get all the benefits of the golden rule, you know, through faith, you know, why, uh, shouldn't we be trying what motivates us? Why, what, why is that in there? Why give it to us? Is that just theory? Is there nothing practical about it? Oh, of course. That brings us to this point. Disciples of Jesus practice the golden rule as a witness, as a witness, not as an attempt to save themselves, not as an attempt to justify themselves, not as an attempt to make up for their sins, but rather as a witness. Our treatment of others is based on how God is already treating us. We not only treat others as we would want to be treated, but also because we have been treated this way by the Father. If you listen, how many times have you said to yourself, you're in a kind of a conflict with somebody and they say something nasty and, or not nice and you know, you're all hurt and everything, you know? and have you ever said to yourself and thought, wow, I mean, the Lord put up with a lot more than this. They spit in his face and they beat him and they, you know, they, they tortured him. I mean, look at everything that he put up. Never mind Jesus, what about Peter and what about Paul? You know, look at all the stuff that they put up with. Surely I can kind of overlook this offense. Surely I can just forgive and let this thing pass. Because look at everything that they went through and they managed to get, surely, I, haven't we all said that to ourselves? Now there may be others who without faith may incorporate these ideas into their lives, but we have a greater capacity to love others for many reasons. God has so loved us that we are moved by His love to love others as well. In, uh, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's at the very beginning of his teaching about the golden rule. Why do we do it? We do it because of a witness. We want to let the, the light shine. Now brothers and sisters, sometimes we're shining at 25 watts and sometimes at 40 and sometimes at 60 watts, sometimes a big 200 watts, you know. The shining is not always the same. You know, sometimes you know, the crop 30 fold, 60 fold, 100, you know, we're not always brightly shining. Why? Well, because we're sinners, that's why. But we try to shine, why? as a witness for how God has, 
has treated us. What does he say in 1 John? He says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propi uh, the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now I'm talking about what is our motivation for this golden rule to make this witness? Because God has loved us and He showed us how to do it. And also the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome our natural sinfulness and selfishness uh, that blocks this love. Paul says, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, but if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so God's word instructs us how to love. I'm motivated because He loved me. He shows me how to love. He gives me practical instructions, you know, Sermon on the Mount. He gives me practical instructions on how to go forward and, and put this love into action. The point I'm trying to get across here is that this is not the blueprint on how we're going to be saved by keeping these new rules. This is the blueprint of how to get to be from a 10 watt bulb to a 50 watt bulb to a, 200, to a 250 watt bulb. In other words, how brightly can you shine? Well, the, the instructions are there in Matthew. The instructions are there teaching us how we ought to treat other people. We cannot fulfill the law and the prophets or even live out the golden rule perfectly, but our faith in Christ confers upon us this perfection and our efforts to practice the golden rule serves as a witness that we are God's people and we are Christ's servants. It's not our love that is as good as gold, it's our faith that is as good as gold. So this is a tremendously important verse and the key to understanding our faith and conduct as Christians. So here are a couple of things to remember as we uh, close out tonight's lesson. First of all, treating others as self is the benchmark quality of disciples of Jesus Christ. It's not the way we save ourselves, it's the way we announce ourselves. Is a difference. We may get church organization right you know, as a group and we, we may understand the proper way to worship you know, without an instrument and all that, you know, and that's, all, that's all good. But if we don't treat others right, we, we've kind of missed the point. We're not shining very brightly if, if, if we don't understand that point. We'll be the ones that are saying, Lord, Lord, and He'll say, I never knew you, if we don't get this part right, how to treat others how to witness in the way we treat others. And then secondly, it's not the degree of love that we have that fulfills the law and the prophets or even the golden rule. It's our faith in Jesus that accomplishes this and motivates us to live in this way. And so our love and our witness of love for others points to the ultimate goal of which the law, the prophets, and the golden rule strive to explore. And that is that one day there will be perfect love between God and man, as well as man and man. A state that was destroyed so very long ago in the Garden of Eden. The golden rule is the rule of the kingdom, and all who live by it now in Jesus' name will share eternally the golden reward of a new heaven and a new earth when the Lord returns. And so if you're not united to Christ by faith, then we encourage you to come confessing your belief, repenting of your sins, being baptized in His name. And if you've not treated others well, and you need the strength to provide a better witness of your faith, then also we encourage you to come forward and receive the prayers and the encouragement of the church so that you can go maybe from being that 40 watt light bulb to maybe a 200 watt light bulb and provide a great witness for the golden rule that God has taught us in His word.